everybody and welcome to the show. I'm Mary Grace and this is a special report episode of Real Talk with Mary Grace. I am coming to you live on the morning of March 17th, 2022. And I hope to see some of you here in the chat. I realize it's early for some of you and uh, we'll catch you on the replay if that doesn't work out. I have with me here today a, a veteran a war correspondent who is reporting from somewhere overseas. I don't have an exact location, but he has been in Ukraine for uh, uh, just over a month, I believe. And this is Chuck Holton. He is an adventurer, an author, a correspondent, and a father, and a, uh, a, a U.S. Army veteran. And so I want to welcome you today. Thank you so much for your time, for coming on the show. Could you just give my listeners a little bit of a rundown of, of your um, your resume, I guess, is one way to say it, and just let us know a little bit about, about more who you are and, and what motivates you to do what you're doing? Um, after leaving the Army, I worked as a stockbroker for 10 years um, after college and then got tired of working in an office and got tired of being away from my kids all the time so i started i went and became a writer and started writing books and in the that was right about the beginning of the war so i started getting asked if i would uh come and comment on things that were happening on the war by various news agencies and that led to them coming to me and saying We've got 40 producers and none of them want to go to the war zone. Would you go to Iraq for us? And uh, so therein began my journalistic career as a war correspondent about 2003. And uh, it just sort of grew from there. I'm, I've been a, a war correspondent now since then. I am kind of a one man band. So I do everything. I go to the, you know, about 20, 25 countries a year and I shoot, edit, write, produce, uh, do on-camera work, whatever they will pay me to do, and uh, work for various different agencies. I'm currently working for Newsmax over in, in Ukraine, and uh, actually just left Ukraine yesterday on my way to another shoot in Egypt uh, tomorrow. So I'm in Romania at the moment, but okay. uh, we'll be heading to Egypt for a week, and then Saudi Arabia for a week, and then Armenia for a week, and then back to Ukraine. So. Interesting. Okay. Wow. That's, that's quite, uh, quite a, a, a history there. Um, okay. yeah. And I, I've listened to a couple of things that you've done with other, uh, on other shows. And one of the things that I thought was very interesting about the work that you do. So, so you're actually, you're, a, you're a veteran of the United States army and you've actually, um, Tell us a little bit about that, because I think that you were talking about how that actually qualifies an individual to be a better war correspondent. And I'd like to hear your take on that, because we see a lot of journalists out there who just sort of picked up a camera and ran into the to the field <laughs> to report. Can you give us a, a rundown on, on how that you're thinking on that? Well, I spent eight years of my life learning to defeat the Soviet army. So here we are essentially fighting the Soviet army in Ukraine. And so. Uh, I think that it gives me a certain amount of context, obviously, uh, to be able to tell the difference between, say, a, a BTR and a ZSU-23-4 and a T-80 uh, is kind of important. Uh, you listen to CNN and they, they'll call everything a tank, whether it's an actual tank or it's a green painted Volkswagen bug, they'll call it a tank. You know, uh, and so they don't have any idea what they're talking about most of the time. And that leads to very skewed reporting. I'll give you a great example of that we've seen over the last couple of weeks. They if you're most of the journalists are based out of Kiev. And so if you're in a hotel in Kiev every night, you're going to hear boom, boom, boom off in the distance. And if you listen to the mainstream media, they'll be reporting live and they'll be saying we're hearing very loud explosions. Uh, which signify that the Russians are, are attacking Kiev right now and they, they're intensifying their attacks on this city. What they don't realize is that, number one, have you ever heard a quiet explosion? <laughs> I mean, they, they, they're calling these very loud explosions. They've never been within 100 yards of an actual explosion. So they don't know what a, they don't know what an explosion is supposed to sound like. Those explosions that you're hearing in Kiev are actually more than 10 miles away. And and most of them are from outgoing fire. They're they're actually the Ukrainians attacking the Russians, 
not the other way around. So they're making inferences or making uh, uh, what would you call, I guess, um, just the uh, yeah, they're they're making um, insinuations about what's going on, but they're actually wrong and they have no idea what they're talking about. So they're giving people back at home a very incorrect view of what's actually happening. So I've got to plug my laptop in, so keep yeah. talking. Yeah, so so it sounds like they're editorializing, which is what we see in general from the news. Um, and, and that brings me to one of the topics that I talk about a lot on my show, and that is uh, the agenda that is coming out of Washington, out of uh, all of the, the global power centers, and uh, and they and using the the media as their mouthpiece to do that. Uh, you know, we, we look at what's going on in in Ukraine. Most of us, most people, couldn't find Ukraine on a map, but all of a sudden, we have an entire population that are wearing uh, Ukraine face masks, Ukraine ribbons, uh, walking around with Ukraine flags. I've seen businesses putting up the Ukraine like wooden Ukraine flags outside of their businesses. Some of them are upside down because they don't know what they're doing. They're it's they're being brought into the PR war uh, on on Ukraine. Can you comment on that as as a correspondent? Just you know what what are you facing there, and how does that affect your job as a correspondent? I wouldn't say it affects my job. I think it's fine if people want to identify with the people who are being victimized. Uh, one of the things that I try to do in my reporting uh, by way of the podcast that I put out, my my Hot Zone podcast, is to not just make the news, but try to make the news a little bit better for the people who are being affected. Because my job is to go to the places where people are having the worst day of their lives and <clears throat> bring their story to the world so that the world can do something about it. And if I didn't feel like there was value in that, it would be the most depressing job in the world because I would just spend all my time with people that are destitute and, and destroyed and their lives are being wrecked. Uh, but because we bring the news to the, the world, then the world does want to do things about it. And especially Americans. Americans are the most charitable people group on the planet. And so um, I think the the nefarious temptation is to feel like by putting a flag emoji on my Facebook profile, I'm actually doing something. You're not. Right. If you want to do something, then send some money to help the help the help the refugees. You know, the Ukrainians, um, I, I mean, I've I've spent the last six weeks there and I've been to Ukraine several times before. So I've I've I know Ukraine. I know the people and they're they're not a very um, happy people. Uh, they're very serious people, uh, maybe for a very good reason. Um, they don't have much of a sense of humor, but that that comes in almost every Soviet country. The Soviet countries were the most soul soul sucking. The Soviet Union was the most soul sucking uh, form of government ever devised by men, and so that has affected Ukraine. However. They're very patriotic and proud people, and they're very homogenous people when it comes to standing together as a people. And you can't help as an American but see that and go, "Dang, that must be nice." I, you know, I, I wish, I, I wish that we could go back to when I was a kid in America, and people used to, you know, believe that America was the greatest place on earth. Uh, and and if people, if there was a weird guy that you know didn't agree with you or whatever. People would just say, well, it's a free country. You don't hear that much anymore in America. You don't hear, hear people say, well, it's a free country. He can think what he wants. He can do what he wants. Um, our country has changed a lot and not for the better um, by being so divided, by politicians working so hard to profit off of that division and to, to exacerbate that. And so I think that if people look at Ukraine and they find things to emulate or to admire about the Ukrainian people, I think that's great. If they want to feel for the people who are being bombed to smithereens in Mariupol, man, absolutely. But it might be better to actually send some money than to just put a flag on your business. You know what I mean? Right, right. Sure. Yeah. Because, I mean, we see a lot of virtue signaling yeah. for what I see is that that 
you know, there was a hard pivot from COVID to Ukraine. And, um, and, and from, from our point of view here, because, uh, because we have been so manipulated by the media, because people have fallen prey to that, um, there, I have a certain healthy skeptic, I have a really big dose of skepticism about what we're seeing. And I think that's, that's good in any situation, uh, because, because let's face it, you know, weapons of mass destruction, what did that get us into? Um, the, the war in, in the Middle East, we were there for 20 years with trillions of dollars and, and we pulled out in a disastrous fashion and lost 13 Americans in the process because of what the current regime did. And so for me personally, and many in my audience, we have a very strong skepticism about what we're being told about, uh, any people group that's being victimized, whether it's Ukraine, whether it's Russians, uh, whether it's Belarus, it doesn't matter. We're not we're not picking sides because of uh, what we know or don't know about the people. We're picking. We're, we're trying to stay neutral and get a a bigger thirty thousand foot view because of the experience that we've had in, in our own lives of just being led down the garden path and, and losing our family members. I mean, you you saw you were there. You saw how many came back maimed and dead from a war that wasn't even ours. And so yeah. I, I want to ask you, um, I, I was, th what, what I'm hearing. So I'm, uh, if you're listening to Laura Logan, uh, her reports coming, she's not there, but she's, you know, she's a seasoned journalist in this field. You know, she's saying that, that Russia, that Putin actually has some legitimate claims in this fight. And uh, and that that he is what he is doing is trying to protect his country from NATO in, uh, incursion uh, in his space, and he's also uh, really focused on these bio labs that have been uh, report that we're being that we're seeing being reported on. So, can mm -hmm. you speak to that aspect yeah. of it? Uh, you know, that the human suffering. Well, that's two different things. Uh, so yeah. let's let's break them down. Let's break them down. Let's take let's take. Take the okay. first one. Does does Vladimir Putin have any legitimate uh, issues or uh, concerns? Uh, of course he does. Uh, it, it, this would be as if China came to Canada and tried to get Canada to join its special anti-U.S. military alliance against the United States. We wouldn't want that to happen. We wouldn't be happy about that. However, let's put it this way. If you live in a neighborhood in you know your typical suburban neighborhood and some people buy the house next door to you from let's say they're from pakistan and they start they paint their house bright pink and they have 50 people over at their house at all times of the day and night and they're obnoxious and loud and you can smell their curry wafting through your into your kitchen from next door and so you're not real happy about having those people sort of upsetting the, 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 the tranquility in your neighborhood. Do you have a right to go burn their house down? Uh, right? Okay, so do, do you have a right to complain to the HOA? Sure. Do you have a right to, to go kick in the door and, and murder those people? Absolutely not. Do you have a right to set their cars on fire? No, you don't. So uh, there is a reason. I mean, first of all, People should be able to make their own decisions about what they want their government to look like. And I think all of us agree on that. And if the Ukrainians feel more uh, kind of pulled toward the West, that's what started the whole Maidan Square thing. Um, and there's a lot of history behind that in Ukraine because there were a couple of million Ukrainians that were murdered by Russia in their grandparents' generation in the 1930s, okay, in the Holodomor. And if you haven't, if you don't know about the Holodomor, go read up about it. The Russians sent their armies into Ukraine and literally confiscated all of the food from the people in the winter of 1932 and left them to starve to death. And two million Ukrainians starved to death. And there are still people in Ukraine alive today who remember that from when they were children, okay? So they have, a real valid reason to be kind of skeptical of being a part of Russia. They don't really want to be a part of Russia. Should right. they have to be a part of, uh, of Russia's alliance because 
they happen to be located next to Russia? I don't think anybody would say that. 14 other countries of, that were former Soviet countries have already joined the, the, the NATO alliance. And we've been just fine with that happening. So the fact that Russia, that mostly Vladimir Putin, has a specific problem with Ukraine joining NATO because Ukraine is the, the home, that, that's the homeland of Russia. The, the Kievan Rus started in Kiev, you know. So he has this histor historical aversion to, well, no, that's, that's off limits. You can't have Kiev. And I, I saw a guy that, that explained it this way, and it kind of made a lot of sense. He said, um, he said it's kind of like Putin and, and Ukraine were dating, and then Ukraine decided, yeah, you're kind of a weirdo, and so I don't really want to date you anymore. So they, they broke up. But he's like the jilted ex lover now. He's like, you can find, you don't have to date me. You can date anybody you want as long as it's not, as long as it's me. You right. have to, I still love you, Jessica. I still <laughs> love you. You can't be. And he's, you know, out there banging on the door at her house. I mean, you, she's calling 911, which is NATO. And NATO's going, um, well, we'll send you some ammo. You can take care of it yourself, Jessica. Right. That's kind of the situation you see here. And so um, does Putin have some legitimate concerns about, the the security of his own country yeah i mean i i see where he's coming from to some extent but number one ukraine and even the west you can't say the west wants to destroy russia we don't want to destroy russia we just don't want them to destroy us so we we'll leave them alone if they leave us alone and i think i, I don't think there are a lot of people that would disagree with that but russia is very paranoid about NATO and everything. And the crazy thing is, if he would have just kept his mouth shut and left left Ukraine alone, NATO probably would have crumbled under the weight of its own bureaucracy by now. But he breathed new life into them and pushed Ukraine further toward NATO by what he did. So he's, he's created a self-fulfilling prophecy out of this. Now, let's go and talk about the bioweapons issues. Yeah. Uh, I have a lot of respect for Laura. Uh, and she's been through the ringer. She's, she is a seasoned correspondent. Uh, she found, or anyway, broke the news uh, of these uh, 15 labs here in Ukraine that were listed on the U.S. Embassy's website. Uh, now, I want to be very, no, I'm not going to say that. I hate it when politicians say, let me be clear. Um, I'm not going to say that. You're not a politician. I want, I want to be very precise about what I say here. And I, I think you should be careful about being very precise when you talk about this issue. There's a difference between bio labs and bio weapons labs, okay? There's a huge difference. There's nothing nefarious about bio labs in and of themselves. Bio labs exist in every veterinary clinic, every university, They're, they all have bio labs, okay? I just went to a bio lab to get a COVID test for my travel to Egypt tomorrow. Uh, so, you know, that's not a nefarious thing in and of itself. I wanted to track down, so, so what are there bio labs in Ukraine that have received funding from the U.S. Department of Defense? Yes, there are 15 of them, okay? I went and visited one here in Kiev. I, I actually drove out there and went and visited the lab, and it's still operating, by the way. And it received about $2 million from the U.S. government. Now, they, uh, well, there was, of course, language issues and stuff, so they didn't, they, I couldn't really get from them. Why did you get money from the U.S. Department of Defense? So, so they, I allowed, tracked down, they allowed you in. You, you went in. You actually were allowed in. It's open. Okay. It's a vet, so, so when you get there, it's a veterinary, res, vet, agricultural and veterinary research center. That's what it is. Okay, that's what it says on the sign out front. And Marvin says, here we go with the word salad. I'm trying to be very precise with you, Marvin, so that you can understand what's going on here. Now, I'm not going to make any claims that there is no nefarious use or reason behind any of this, because nobody can really know. But I'm going to just share with you what I found to be true by going to the lab and then by interviewing somebody who was actually a part of this program in the United States. So and I have a good friend, American. I have a good friend who is an American Lieutenant yeah. Colonel retired from the US Military Veterinary Corps, okay? And 
he I remembered him telling me about 15 years ago about a deployment that he did to Ukraine. And I had asked him at the time, like, why would it why would the army send a veterinarian to Ukraine? And I I forgot in the last 15 years what his answer was, but I remembered that he was there. So I called him and I said, uh, Colonel Scott, tell me, tell me what's going on and what, what what's the deal with these bio labs? And he goes, oh, he goes, I'll explain it to you. There is a defense threat reduction agency. Mm-hmm. And under that defense threat reduction agency is a defense bio threat reduction program. Biological threat reduction program. And he said, I actually worked for that program, worked with that program. And he said, here's here's what we did. We we set up, uh, there are bio labs that exist, like I said, all over the world. They're already pre-existing. Uh, every university, every veterinary clinic, whatever, all over the world. The United States has a vested interest in the in the interest of its national security of getting um, as much advance notice as possible if there is some sort of biological threat like COVID, okay, or like Ebola or like, you know, um, like uh, uh, anthrax, for example, okay. Tracy, you don't have to buy it. I'm just telling you what I learned. And you, uh, look, I know there's going to be a lot of your viewers that are going to go. Oh, this is gonna be a, so they're I'm not lying to you. Uh, I'm telling you exactly what I found out, okay? And I can show you the interview I did with this lieutenant colonel friend of mine, and you can listen to what he said yourself if you like, okay? It's on my it's on my website, on my Hot Zone podcast. So here's what he told me. He said, because we have a vested interest in getting as much advance notice of some sort of biological threat as possible, we go out to these pre-existing we these pre-existing labs and we give them money to elevate their technology to the point where they can tell the difference between for example anthrax that exists in the soil you know anthrax is a natural biological pathogen that you can find in on any farm in the world in the soil but taking that anthrax and and weaponizing it aerosolizing it takes a state lab you know state level lab like a like a North Korea lab or something, right? And so most of these labs have the ability to detect anthrax, but they can't detect if it's weaponized anthrax or naturally occurring anthrax. It's just anthrax to them. So what they do is they go give them money and elevate their technological ability so that they can tell the difference between those two. And that way, if they detect a weaponized strain of something, they can alert the United States long before it gets to our shores. I don't know if you remember about maybe 15 years ago, there was a um, there was a hoof and mouth or foot and mouth disease in the UK. Yeah. uh, Like a mad cow thing or something. They had to destroy like all the cattle in the UK. He said this program allowed us to get word of that soon enough that we didn't have to destroy all the all the cattle in the United States. It didn't make it to the US. Right. We were able to stop it. So that's what he said. Okay. I'm not saying, I mean, I, look, this is a guy that I know personally that I've yeah. known for many, many years that I trust implicitly. He's actually godfather to my children. Right. So if he says it, I believe it, but you don't have to believe it. You right. You could be lying. And there could be, there could be stuff that those labs are doing that even he doesn't know about. But I'm just telling you what I found about those labs. And that's all I know. Right, right, and you know, and and to that point, uh, my dad, my stepdad was was a um, Air Force veteran, and then he went into civil service, and he worked with FEMA, and he had a uh, high classification clearance. And uh, to this day, when you ask him about work that he did, he gives you a version of what he did that he's allowed to tell, even to this day, right? Mm-hmm. Even things might have been declassified since that time, but he he's not privy to that. And so we know in the military that people with certain clearances have a story that they tell. I'm not saying that your friend is in that position, but we Maybe do. Maybe he is. I don't know. I mean, if, if, he's, but the if question, he's had that clearance and he couldn't tell yeah. me, then he wouldn't tell me that he was lying. But we also know that there's, you know, there's a fine line between a lab that is a bio lab that becomes a bioweapons lab. And if we learned anything over the last two years, 
we were told that Wuhan was a bio lab. And then suddenly, yes, we have an entire yes. world shutdown. And right. the thing is, we know now from FOIA uh, requests that Fauci and Collins were emailing about this and that they were fully aware. And right. So as I mean, my you're you're seeing now. My listeners are very skeptical because of that's good. And that's doing good. And I understand they're skeptical. And uh, and no, yeah. uh, sun also rises. Send it says uh, no. Politicians are not denying that the labs exist or denying that we've been funding them. At least I, this guy that I talked to. Yes, they exist. Yes, we've been funding them. It was for a defensive purpose is what he said not an offensive purpose exactly. now let me just let's just let let's go take it just to ukraine right now okay yeah. yeah even if that's a lie even if they were for a you know nefarious purpose come over here please and try to convince me that it merits bombing the opera house in Mariupol, where there were 500 children hiding in the basement yesterday. Please, please come try and justify for me why any weapons lab that exists in, in Ukraine justifies murdering all these civilians. I'll okay. listen. And that brings me to my next question, which is that I'm seeing reports of, um, of that Ukraine is actually firing on its own people, on its That's own bull. That's bull. Okay. I, I, I'm, I'm there. I mean, I'm, I've, I've been on the ground with them. They're not firing. They're, okay. they're not firing on their own people. No, okay. uh, that uh, I can, I can 100% guarantee you that's not happening. Okay. I, I mean, I can't be everywhere, but I'm right. saying from wh where I have been on the ground, that is not happening. Okay. Mm -hmm. uh, the, yes, there have been some fake videos out there uh, that have been put out and there, there are lots of, uh, hobbyists, I'll call it, right? Ukrainian and otherwise, who yeah. like to take Obvious. videos and make little fake videos and, and put them out yeah. there. Yeah, yeah. But well, there is also a very robust open source Intel community. These are hobbyists also who are taking those videos and separating the wheat from the chaff, proving that the ones that are fake are fake and putting it out there on Telegram channels. Okay. to to prove that they're fake okay right. they're, and they're showing the proof so they're but the vast majority of the videos that you're seeing of you know ukrainians that are uh, that are dying they're they're actually ukrainians dying i've been to the hospital i've i've been to the bridge where they're coming across shot and wounded i've carried them myself okay mm -hmm. this the, this carnage that's happening over here is not fake it's okay. actually happening. Okay. Now, and that leads me to my next question is there typically in a situation like this. Um, and again, I'm, I'm, I, I'm just, I'm just wired this way. So I'm going to ask the skeptical, the skeptics questions. Um, the typically we see just masses and masses and masses of just live cell phone footage from civilians on the ground mm -hmm. in a situation like this. People are saying, where is that? People are questioning, like, why are we not seeing footage? Uh, you know, just, you know, just the selfie videos that people are doing live. Um, there's, there's tons of, I mean, what do you mean you're not seeing it? it it's everywhere. It, I it's, mean, Hundreds it's, and hundreds every day. And my, my phone is blowing up nonstop with that stuff. Okay. Uh, maybe you're not subscribed to the right Telegram channels and YouTube channels and uh, not YouTube, but I mean, uh, WhatsApp channels. Uh, but I'm, I mean, good grief. I could scroll through and send you about a hundred of them right now. Yeah. Let's uh, to say nothing of the ones yeah. I'm filming, you know? Yeah. Yeah. It's it, it, like I said, the, the tel most of the Telegram channels I'm seeing, we are, um, we're seeing the ones that are getting debunked. That's that's what's coming across the feeds that I'm watching. Now, um, somebody has a question in the chat. We're going to come to that in just a second. But uh, let's just get to the corruption element of it, uh, mm -hmm. because this is what hits to the heart of every citizen. Because the truth is, it's the citizens who are the victims of everything that's happening. Absolutely. The Russian citizens, the Ukrainian citizens, uh, the American citizens. Uh, you know, we, we were just 
told that our government is sending $800 million to Ukraine and Americans, you know, Congress spent, I think, six months, six weeks deciding whether Americans were going to get $600 in relief for lockdowns. Um, so again, there's, there's a, there's a real sore spot here with sending money to a country um, that is is not a NATO country. We don't have a sworn allegiance to them, and now we're sending them weapons and money, um, mm -hmm. and and we're cutting Russia off completely uh, from everything. But let's go to the corruption element because we know that there's corruption. We know that Ukraine is is the is ground zero for the corrupt oligarchs and for the current resident in the White House and the money laundering that's been happening for years, not to mention the human trafficking. These are things that we've that we've seen evidence of. Um, you know, we all heard the phone call that Joe Biden did or the description of what he said about how he was withholding aid until they well until they stopped the um the um looking into Burisma, right? Because his son was on the board. We all know that. So how how do we square that? How how do we square, yes, there is there there is death, there is destruction. These people are being victimized. However, it's still the poorest country in Europe, in spite of all the billions that we've sent them as a nation. And we have Americans who are dying, who've closed their businesses, who have committed suicide because of the lockdowns and because mm -hmm. of the oppression of this government. We have Americans rotting in jail in DC who still haven't been charged with crimes from January 6th. So how do we square what's happening right now? Um, how, how can all of the, I mean, why can't all of those things be true? They can be true, but, but as a, like, you know, what do we tell the American people? At what point is enough enough in taking care of the rest of the world? Right. What, how, oh, how, yeah. No, I, 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 you're speaking my language now. I'm, of course, you're, what you're asking me for is commentary, opinion, and, and yeah. I can happily give yeah. that. Uh, and not, not, I mean, I'm, I'm in Ukraine reporting on Ukraine. I, there, there, it's not my job yeah. to do opinion yeah. and, and all yeah. that. But, uh, I, okay. The, uh, let me correct a couple things first. Okay. Number one, Ukraine is not the poorest country in Europe. Moldova is the poorest country in Europe. Um, but the neither here nor there. It's one of the one of the poorest. Yeah, it's really okay. Um, uh, and yes, we're. It's ridiculous that we can immediately give, you know, whatever billions of dollars to Ukraine, and we it took forever to get any of our own money back to us from the government. Uh, during the COVID crisis, yeah, that's that's ridiculous. So I mean, again, all of these things can be true at the same time. When you talk about the corruption in Ukraine, um, and and then you talk about the calls between Biden and Ukraine and Burisma and all that, are you making the case that Ukraine is corrupt or the United States is corrupt? Because, Both, absolutely. Well, Both. Okay, one hundred percent. Thank and you. I'll take it a step further. Um, let me just address something in the chat here because I think that one of you, one of your listeners, is mistaking our conversation for me attacking you. That's not what I'm doing. No, I'm, you're not attacking me. Yeah. Okay, no. so I just want to be clear with uh, William. I'm not attacking Chuck. We're we're having a, a spirited dialogue, and I think sure. we more of these. No, these are good questions to bring out. These are these are very good things yeah. to address. If, if you watch, I, I mean, the only thing I that I think is uh, not profitable is people that just go, you know that's not true or you're gaslighting or what i mean look if you don't want to listen then hang up right yeah, got it if you if you if you don't want my opinion then don't listen to it i'm just giving you my opinion i'm not even telling you it's i'm just to, telling yep. you the truth as best i can yeah and i'm and i'm giving you my opinion on this now when it comes to corruption yeah show me a government that's not corrupt and and the fact that the governments are corrupt and the governments are causing all this crap over in ukraine because of uh, some uh let's call it an ego measuring contest mm -hmm. uh, between uh, a bunch of world leaders is it just makes it that much more profane that these people are hurting so bad that they are hurting so many so many i mean i was on a bus yesterday at the romanian border watching these mothers get on the bus with their children and their children are sobbing. The mothers are sobbing. Everybody's, their, their lives are being torn apart. 
their lives are being ruined. And for what? The day before that, I went to a, 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 a an apartment building in Kiev that got hit by a missile. There's no militarily significant target around that apartment building. Mm -hmm. And a missile slammed into it and just killed a bunch of people and destroyed a bunch of people's lives and businesses and memories. And, and for what? I mean, for what? Because Vladimir Putin's got some ninth grade history lesson idea of what Ukraine needs to be. Give me a break. Does it, ha and, and did anything the U.S. did contribute to this? Absolutely. Without a doubt. And can uh, you expand on that? How, how did the U.S. contribute to what Putin is doing now? Joe Biden did, has literally done everything 180 degrees backwards from what he, what he should have done. He projected weakness instead of strength. If Joe Biden had not, well, I, let's put it this way. I believe that August 28th, 2021 will go down in history as the day that America stopped being a world superpower. Because uh, that pullout from Afghanistan showed the entire world that the United States is not to be feared, not to be respected. It, it emboldened our adversaries and discouraged our allies around the world. And so because of that act, because of that absolute tragedy in Afghanistan, Vladimir Putin said, hmm, this might be the time to take Ukraine because Joe Biden's not going to really do anything about it. Mm -hmm. Now, what he's doing now was sending a ton of money that doesn't belong to him and sending a bunch of weapons over here that are durable and fungible and are probably going to be shooting back at us at some point. Is, was that a good idea? No, it's not a good idea. It's the worst idea, but the only it's the it's the worst idea because that's what we're left with right now, because he did the wrong thing in the beginning. He started out by projecting weakness. That weakness emboldened our adversaries. And then everything he did in the run up to this war only emboldened Putin all the more. And now the steps he's taking, some of which you know, he's, he's kind of backed into a corner. He kind of has to take because that's what the American people want right now. We, they want us to help Ukraine and to now. Not if we, the people I know. I mean, I, and I'm not saying, I'm not saying we don't want to help the people. I'm yeah. saying we don't want our weapons or our money anymore. We don't want to I don't want another dime of my money in Ukraine for that matter. No. I don't think I want it in Russia either. However, I've, I've said so, for many years that if, if there is a cause worth fighting for out there on the world stage somewhere, we should have a, a hard and fast policy that we will not give weapons to any other country to do our fighting for us. If it's worth fighting for, then it's worth sending our sons and daughters to fight for it. And if it's not worth sending our sons and daughters to fight for it, then maybe we ought to stay out of it. Well, but here's, okay, I'm going to come back to you with, with my thoughts on this. We have, the causes that America has championed uh, have not been the causes of the people. However, our sons and daughters have been sent to fight the wars, to fight proxy wars for politicians who have financial interests in these countries. And do you, do you honestly believe that if, if Biden and 99% of Washington did not have financial and other interests to protect in Ukraine that they would give a damn about what's happening there right now. I, I, I don't, I don't know that they would. Um, I mean, you, you have a lot of people that are in the highest levels of government right now who are old cold warriors and yeah. sort of saw Russia as a, you know, just the, our arch adversary. Uh, I think, Unfortunately, I mean, I was coming around to the idea that maybe we didn't need to worry about Russia so much mm -hmm. uh, up until this event happened. Uh, now, what they're doing in what, what they were doing in the uh, in the Donbass region and Donetsk and Luhansk um, was was egregious. You know, having gone in there in 2014 and and annexed those areas. But if they, if the people in those areas voted and wanted to be part of Russia, then they ought to be able to be part of Russia. I think people, we ought to let people do what they want. 
Yeah. I'm kind of a libertarian that way. Yeah. And if, if Ukraine didn't like it, tough, too bad. I, did, I really didn't care. I was down on the border uh, before the war started. Uh, I'm, I'm, I mean, the border, the red line between the separatist regions and the Ukrainian part. part. And they were, uh, I, I did not hear any outgoing fire. There were, there were ceasefire violations every day I was there. I did not hear any of it coming from Ukraine. All of it was coming from the separatist regions into Ukraine. And I was visiting villages that were being hit by those rockets and artillery and stuff. Mm -hmm. uh, again, just full of farmers and stuff like why, right? So I was I was even uh, accosted by a Russian speaking guy on when I was on camera. I was doing a live hit, and he came up to me on camera, and he was kind of drunk, and he was like, oh, "You know, you're not telling the truth." And I said, "I'm I'm just here reporting what's going on. You tell me what's going on, and and you tell the truth." And I just gave him the mic, and he talked for a minute, and then kiss me on both cheeks and stagger off. I'm not here with an agenda. I don't, I don't care. I, I, I want to show what's going on. I mean, what I do care about is the 96 year old grandmother that got abandoned by her caretaker because he was fleeing for his life. And she was stuck in her apartment with no care, nobody to care for. Her. That's what I care about. I, I mean, you, I wouldn't have a soul if I could come and report on what's going on here and go here and see all this human misery and be more worried about bio labs, I'm sorry, don't care. However, don't care. However the bio labs, uh, uh, bio lab is, is what has um, resulted in American grandmothers dying alone in, in nursing homes for the past two years without a single family member being able to see them. So, I, that didn't I, I, come from Ukraine, uh, and, oh, and it didn't come from the majority. Yeah. The, like I say, I mean, I I tend to believe my friend who was part of that, and right, uh, part, right. part of that network. And but I, is it I think that, is it possible that it could have, or that it could? So uh, uh, no, it's I, no, it's more than possible. It's yeah, so, certain that the yeah. United States has bioweapons labs in places around the world. I'm mm -hmm. saying the one that I visited in Kiev, I don't think was a bioweapons lab because no, I've been to some bioweapons labs mm -hmm. and this and and the security around those things is way stronger than the security of the lab, the veterinary clinic that I went to in mm -hmm. a nondescript neighborhood, residential neighborhood in downtown Kiev, where I literally opened the gate and walked in and walked right. in the building with no security right. at all. But there's okay. no way for us to know. Again, let's let's go back to the corruption. But I think the thing that that has people so incensed about Ukraine in general. Again, not the grandmothers, not the babies, not the mothers. That's not what we're talking about. However, we are very Americans who are awake and have been watching what's been going on for the past two years are very angry about what has happened to should our be. children and our grandmothers and our grandfathers. Yeah, it and I take care of my elderly dad, and you know, I, I would I would die and go to prison before I let him go into any facility right now with what's going on. And I know a lot of people who would do that. Yeah. Um, however, let's go back to the corruption because this is an issue that cannot be overlooked. Um, there, yes, every country is corrupt. I get that, but it's becoming increasingly clear with evidence that Ukraine is is a hub. It's an epicenter of corruption for uh, for globalist uh, elites who are using Ukraine as a launch pad and as a um, as a cash for all of the corruption that has been going on for a long, long time. And Americans have and Americans and Ukrainians have not only been footing the bill financially, but uh, from a security standpoint um, on down the line. And so how can we justify as Americans, again, being told once again, that we are responsible um, to protect the interest of the, our politicians who have developed a stronghold in that nation? Uh, uh, I wouldn't say we are. Corruption. Um, I, I, I mean, I, I wouldn't I wouldn't say that we as Americans should be responsible for this. I, I mean, it is horrific what's happening to the people here. And I, you know, do you know that Ukrainians themselves have donated 
more than $20 million to their own military to buy night vision and body armor and things like that for their own military. They've donated to their own military, okay? Um, people around the world, if they want to support Ukraine, they can support Ukraine. Mm -hmm. I don't think the government of the United States has any right whatsoever to take my money by force and send it to Ukraine. I don't think they do. And that's what they're doing. That's what, exactly what they're doing. And they shouldn't be. And they shouldn't need to. And they probably wouldn't have needed to right. if we didn't project the weakness on the world stage that gave Vladimir Putin the green light. The, the only thing that I take issue with that I that I maybe I'm imagining it from a lot of people, uh, you know, on, look, I'm I'm a little bit to the right of Attila the Hun. OK, I'm no I'm no leftist at all. I OK. Yeah. But the, I but I am kind of disgusted when I get the feeling that people are saying there's corruption in Ukraine. Therefore, they're getting what they deserve. Oh, I think because I, I would like you to come that's here. That's not what my listeners are saying. Yeah, my listeners are not. I, I get that feeling sometimes. And yeah, I take it with that. Right. But that's the only that's the right. only problem I've got with it. However, if, yeah, this is a distinction I draw very clearly on my show when I talk about they get what they deserve. I'm talking, we're talking about the globalists and the elites who are running the yeah. country and who are killing their own people willingly and using them for cannon fodder, just like with right. China. I don't have a, a grievance with the Chinese people. And so anybody that I know that's in my circle who says they get what they deserve, we're talking about the the leadership of that country. I can't disagree with that. I mean, who? Uh, I, I don't know how you disagree with that. I just want to clarify that. Now, we have. I have a question in the chat here that I think is a good question to pivot to now. Um, this is Donald on Facebook. He says, um, when will the shooting stop? When will the, when, when all the weapons are expended, uh, will more and more be needed endlessly in this death dance that benefits military contractors? What's the most hopeful outcome today, March 17th, 2022? Wow. That is the question and a very, very good one Donald, for that question. Uh, I, I, I applaud you for asking that question. Uh, I so my sense is from being here, number one, Russia is losing this war. Uh, you're not hearing that a lot on the mainstream media because the mainstream media doesn't know what they're talking about. Mostly their reporters here, like I say, don't know the difference between a tank and a green painted Volkswagen bug. They don't know the difference between incoming and outgoing fire. Uh, and so for those of us who do know the difference, um, it's plain to see that Russia is completely losing this war. And when dictatorships and, and totalitarian regimes are losing, they get more and more brutal. So we, will, we are seeing them get more and more brutal. And they're bomb because it's much easier to bomb a civilian area and terrorize the populace in an attempt to make them submit than it is to go toe-to-toe -to -toe with military that is kicking your butt every time they come up against you. So that's what you're seeing. And you're, I'm, I'm afraid you're going to see a lot more of that. I think that Russia has already lost this war in many ways. They just haven't admitted it yet. Vladimir Putin is done. Uh, he, he won't, it, you know, he's dead. He just hasn't laid down yet. Uh, but between now and when he actually realizes that, uh, one of two things will happen. There will either be some sort of political solution, sell out, whatever, uh, or they're literally going to crumble here and go crawling back into, or he's going to go, um, you know, it, it, I can see Vladimir Putin doing something truly desperate, uh, which is potentially using some sort of chemical attack or like a an attack on chernobyl to create a, a nuclear problem for all of europe because that's that's something that he how would thinks that he can him? deny how would that i mean how that that would hurt him nothing he can do will benefit him at this point right he, but there's nothing he could do that it, will, he's done but his only his only thought is as you know as he's realizing that he's going down well i'm going to take the west with me i'm going to take everybody else with me and so I doubt he would use nuclear because he would turn his 
his own country into a nuclear slag heap if he did that. But mm -hmm. if he, if he say, put an RPG into the sarcophagus at Chernobyl nuclear plant and created a, a, a plausible deniability that no, that was the Ukrainians army that did that. Mm -hmm. um, and then created this nuclear, you know, sort of winter for Europe. Mm -hmm. uh, I, I mean, I, that's the only thing I could see him, you know, really getting away with. Uh, now it's going to take everybody down. Right. But, um, so this, what, this is the question I have, you know, he's, he's not a stupid man. He's, and he's, he's a strong nationalist. He has great pride in Russia and the Russian people. Yeah. I, I don't get the sense that, I mean, he's not, I don't think he's dumb enough to launch a chemical attack. I don't think that he's dumb enough to, to launch a nuclear attack or to create a situation that would further decimate his country. Now, here's one thing that I, that I do think, because we've seen this before, I wouldn't put it past um, nefarious actors who are not Ukrainian, not Russian to, uh, launch a chemical attack. I, I wouldn't even put it past our own, uh, CIA to do this, to further escalate tensions, um, a false flag as it were to launch a false flag attack. Uh, and, and, and what I hear coming from the media is that they're setting the stage for that to make Putin the scapegoat for a false flag chemical attack that would justify further intervention. Um, and, and of course, if it hit any NATO country, that would bring us into full scale war. I, I happen to yeah. believe that we're already in World War III because of the information war and that COVID yeah. was the start of that. But that would- I think we are too. That would bring us into a kinetic war. So mm -hmm. what do you say about that angle I just don't think Putin is stupid enough to launch a chemical attack. I do, however, believe that our CIA and the propaganda media arm of the of that of not just the CIA, the deep state, has um, absolutely every reason to to scapegoat Putin into a chemical or nuclear attack. Um, if you look at the propaganda uh, that comes out of Russia, Russian state media before everything that they've done they have created the pretext in their media to try to blame it on the ukrainians okay so before they attacked oh, yeah uh, out of the donbass they created uh, there was a ton of media coming out of russia that was making it like ukraine is going to uh, you know attack us yeah setting the and so that so that gives him justification to get on tv and say i i'm not attacking Ukraine, I'm saving Ukraine from the Nazis or, you know, whatever. So he's, he's created this pretext every time. Mm -hmm. Well, what's been coming out of the Russian state media lately that the Ukrainians are going to launch a chemical attack or that the U Ukrainians are going to attack Chernobyl and create a nuclear problem. That's why I say those two things. It's Russia. <laughs> the American now, now, is, is telling us they're propagandizing that it's going to be Russia. So we're so so in other words the gaslighting is coming from all different directions setting the stage for this. And and so it it feels like we're I mean there's a there's a standoff in the information war uh as much as anything else. Mm -hmm. What do you say to yeah, that? No, you're I mean the information war the information battle space is the most important battle space these days. Yeah. Uh, and and so yes, there's a tremendous amount of fighting going on in, in both sides. Now, to your question about whether or not we could get some kind of deep state um, false flag operation that would blame it on Russia, I don't know. Maybe I, I'm not. I wouldn't rule it out. It's been done. I, I certainly don't trust anybody in our government far enough not to do something stupid like that. Mm -hmm. uh, I I've kind of feel like, you know. It's not my job to try to uh, opine on the deep state and all that. It's my job to go out in the field and to show you what the results of their actions are uh, and, and let the American people know what the results of these terrible actions are so that maybe the American people can put enough pressure on their government or maybe go vote at the ballot box, for God's sake and and vote out the deep state in any way shape they can in any way they can 
So I want to I want to shift the conversation a little bit because there's a there's um, an interesting thread that I came across on Twitter that was actually put up in 2019, and uh, this is it's very interesting because the the author here is talking about a um, a uh, an aerospace company manufacturer in Ukraine that uh, it's called Motor Zik S I C H. And it's a company that manufactures helicopters, but it also manufactures a, a massive airplane that is capable of launching satellites. Uh, so it, it can reach heights that, that allow it to launch satellites and they can do it in a much more affordable way than doing individual satellites with rockets. And this is technology that China wants to access. Um, are you familiar with that situation? Um, it's in, it's in a, an area called uh, I can't pronounce it. Uh, Zaporid, Zaporizhia. 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 I almost got it. Yeah. Yeah. Um, any, any. I know they bombed a. I know they bombed an airfield there. Maybe that's what they bombed it for. They bombed the Antonov aircraft plant in Kiev the other day, which was yeah. about the only militarily significant thing that they've they bombed. Yeah, I, I've been through Zaporizhia. Yeah. So, um, yeah. So, so the interesting thing that I think about this is that. China obviously wants access to that. So where does China come into this? Have you, do you have any ideas, any thoughts? Uh, you know, China has a very long-term vision for world domination. And I think I could speak a lot more to China's place in trying to, uh, I agree with you, Deb, uh, China's place in trying to, uh, destroy the United States from within than I could Russia's because I've done a lot more reporting on that. Uh, I think in this situation, China is watching what Russia, what's happening with Russia and they're taking notes. And, you know, Russia just went to them and said, hey, could you give us some uh, military hardware? Because they're getting their heads handed to them. And, and China was like, well, think about, no. Uh, so, <laughs> I think that says something about how China thinks this is going with Russia. If China thought Russia was winning, they probably would be like, yeah, sure, here you go. You know, they'll give you what we'll give you what you want. But China sees that Russia's going down. Somebody asked uh, about if uh, why Russia is such a huge country and, and Ukraine is so poor, how are they winning against the Russians? Well, Russia's a big country, but they're not a rich country. Their economy is only the size of Texas. And they are now the largest third world country on the planet. Uh, thank you, Vladimir Putin. Their uh, GDP per capita is now somewhere on par with Namibia or Mongolia. Uh, so think about that for a minute. Their gross domestic product per capita with all the people they have in Russia, it used to be about where Baha the Bahamas is. Now it's where Namibia is. So they are on par with a legit third world African country with their economy now. So they have the second largest military in the world, but it is tremendously under-trained, under, -trained, under uh, poorly led, poorly motivated, and uh, poorly disciplined. And because of that, about the only thing that they can do well is kill civilians. And that's why we're seeing it happen so much here in Ukraine. Now you said uh, on a on a podcast that I listened to earlier this week that that the Russians didn't want to be there, um, that the Russian soldiers don't. The soldiers it, don't. It's not their they're conscripts. They're, they're kids. Are. They're conscripts. And they're getting killed. You know, uh, and nobody wants to be on the losing team, first of all. they uh, Now, Ukraine's been doing something that's terrible. It's against the Geneva Convention. They've been taking Russian POWs and putting them on television and letting people enter. They let CNN go interview Russian soldiers. Yeah. That's contravention of the Geneva Convention right there by itself. Completely wrong. Is but, anything, are we doing anything about it? Because Russia, I mean, I, you, nope, Ukraine, nope, we're not. the media darling, so they get away with that? They get, they get away with it and they shouldn't. I mean, uh, some of us have called them out on it, mm -hmm. but they shouldn't do that. 
it's 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 wrong to do that. You don't you, you don't do that with prisoners of war, but they're doing it. Yeah. All that said, you listen to what the POWs are saying and like, how can you know what to believe of what they say? Because they might be under duress. I mean, you know, get put you on television and, and what, you know, we'll see what you say. But yeah, yeah. if you can believe anything that they're saying, these guys are saying we're going four and five days without being resupplied with food. We, we're running out of food. We don't have any ammo. We don't have any fuel. We got left behind. That's why we got captured because our unit took off and left us and didn't even tell us they were leaving. And so we were we were stuck. Uh, so, so what happens? What happens when when Russia completely um, divest from the world financial system? Speaking of poor, I mean, because that's that's on the verge of happening. And yeah, they've been doing they've been working on that since 2014. Yeah, so that uh, in 2014, when I was here reporting on the Maidan Square massacre. Russia had $200 billion in U.S. currency in petrodollars. Mm -hmm. And I remember making a piece about that. Like if Russia really wanted to hurt the United States, all they'd have to do is just liquidate all their, their U.S. dollars at once. You know how much Russia, how much money of ours Russia has now? Like none. They've gotten rid of all of their U.S. petrodollars over the last eight years. And they've gone to gold. So now they've got a huge buffer of gold that Putin is hoping will allow them to weather this storm. Um, Seems to be a little more stable at this point than the petrodollar. Without a doubt. I'm not a financial expert, but a uh, hard currency versus a um, the petrodollar. Oh, a move. The petrodollar is what's gotten us into the situation we're in now. As it, as yeah. the Dom, I agree with you. This is all about the petrodollar. Yeah, yeah. And, and you know, speaking of which, um, I, I think one of the things that people are are not realizing is that that um, the U.S. is actually the biggest uh, liquid natural gas exporter to Europe. It, it's not Russia. Now, crude oil, I'm not so sure, but I don't know actually how much Europe is being hurt by by sanctioning Russia um, and preventing the the pipeline. I, I'm not an expert on that, but I've seen a little bit of data on it, and I I just I mean. Putin has said that he actually feels like um, that that he feels like the West is actually being more harmed by the sanctions placed on Russia than act than Russia is being hurt. I don't know about that. I mean, that, that doesn't sound um, accurate to me. But I mean, it is definitely hurting the West a lot, um, and it's going to hurt the West a lot. And go, you know, fill your tank with fuel and find out. Um, the, that. Supply. is that, that that is as many of the uh, many republicans are saying the fact that that we're we've stopped buying gas from russia has like literally nothing to do with the price of gas in america since we have so we have hundreds and hundreds of years of petroleum fuel in our ground that we can <laughs> we, all we have to do is turn on the spigot but they won't let us um so I've, yeah. I've, been, I've actually done quite a bit of reporting on that, if you go okay. back and look. Okay, yeah. I mean, that that's a huge issue. And then the other thing, too, I, it, let's come back to America for a minute. America is is tied to the petrodollar. We have a, um, the Federal Reserve is is printing money hand over fist. No and, um, you know, could you, could you see a situation where America goes back to the gold standard like Russia is doing? I mean, is that something that you see no. happening? No, because politicians don't want that kind of accountability. They, they, they wouldn't do it. It's like they're, they're, they're crack addicts and that their, their crack is the U S dollar and they just can hit the little button and print more anytime they want. And they're so addicted to crack. They, they can't go back. They can't get off of that. But what because, happens, what happens when the world markets no longer want us want our debt? Well, then what happens? That day's coming. It's that that is not an when question. I mean, an if question. It's a when yeah. question. They uh, look. I was a stockbroker for ten years. We could talk. Yeah. We could do a whole episode on yeah. uh, U.S. money supply. But um, I, I, I just, without a doubt, it's not a matter of uh, pol policy. It's a matter of arithmetic. It's just plain math. Like it's it has to happen. The U.S. currency has to collapse. And they're starting to talk about trying to come up with a, like a U.S. cryptocurrency, U.S. dollar or cryptocurrency or something that would just allow them to print yeah. even more of it. Right. Um, yeah, that, that would, know, yeah. And that would also be a digital, 
it, it would basically be a digital tether to every single right. human being, which right. I, I, I'm not participating in that. Um, the, uh, but the, the, I had a question, but I kind of lost my train of thought on this. Uh, yeah. So it feels like we're getting to that point now that we're talking about, um, American politicians, it feels like we're getting to that point that our forefathers were at where it, there comes a time when the grievances are to the point and the politicians that we've elected have gotten to the point where, where they actually need to be completely replaced and our form of government needs to be uh, brought down to the to the pillars and the the uh, yeah. the foundation and rebuilt. Yeah. And do, where do you, I, I want to bring Donald Trump into the conversation? We haven't his name hasn't come up uh, once, which is remarkable because uh, you know I think that what's going on today has a lot to do with the fact that he's not in the Oval Office right now. Yeah. Um, yeah. What do you see him doing with? the party and how do you think that his presence even now his activity is is affecting is going to affect the coming elections and even like the future of this country do you see him doing a restructuring and trying to facilitate that i am not going to try to get into the head of donald trump and just and figure out what he's but i mean part of the allure of donald trump is that he's so erratic and you don't, and nobody really knows what he's going to do or say. So That's just, part of the reason why he kept our our enemies guessing for four years. Uh, and it's it's actually one of the more likable qualities about the guy. Uh, I mean, I've met him, and um, I you know I, I don't I can't say I know him, but I mean I yeah. I know him just from as much as anybody else does. I don't uh, I don't know what he is going to do. I don't know if he knows what he's going to do. Uh, from moment to moment, but uh, anything that he did would be better than what we have right now. Uh, he, he could not make. He, he literally, even out. if he tried to make it worse, he would end up making it better. <laughs> well, he kept us out of war. Yeah. Uh, you know, we actually had. Uh, we were energy independent. Um, I, I think that he actually knew very well what he was doing. Now he walked into a hornet's nest in DC yeah. uh, and was surrounded by uh, Obama holdovers surround. I mean, you know, this is a man I think that led the country with two hands tied behind his back and did better. Right. Than, and I, I mean, you got to respect the guy for what he did. Um, but, uh, but I, there's I, no, no doubt. Look, yeah. Donald Trump probably saved America uh, in, in so many ways. And he was a giant pulsating middle finger to the left, which I love. I think that was great. <laughs> the fact that he is uncouth could care less. The fact that he's not a nice person could care less. We don't want a nice person in the in the White House. We want a we want a jackass. I mean, we we want somebody who's going to kick against the boards. And I only wish he had been more acerbic. I only wish he had been more offensive. Okay. You wanted the more mean tweets. Yeah, we. I mean, well, I don't know about. I mean, I think Twitter is a waste of time for anybody, especially if you're a U.S. president. Um, and, and if he had, if he had just passed that off to somebody else and focused on, like, absolutely wreck, like you said, taking it down to the studs, yeah, in the house in the U.S. government, firing everybody and only hiring back maybe a third of those people, uh, a third of uh, of those jobs he had he had replaced, it would have been it would have been better. Any, I, I mean. Look, well, I we don't have, have a problem. With, I mean, I, I I voted for Donald Trump. I'm very glad he was president. Mm -hmm. uh, and so I'm I'm not anti-Trump. I don't think he's a nice person, but I don't care. Mm -hmm. I don't care if he's a nice person. I mean, I just say that because I've met him, and he's actually more arrogant and and bombastic in person than he is on TV. If you can believe that or uh, believe it, but. <laughs> I've ever heard say that. And I know a lot of people who've spent quite a bit of time with him. Well, they, and they probably know him much better than yeah. I ever did. You know, yeah. like I said, I just yeah. met him and spent very little time with him, but that was my sense of him. But I like to say, I don't care. Yeah. I don't care. Public, I've heard him describe he, he's a baller, right. In, in a, in a public set, setting, because that's part of his persona yeah. in, in private, in, you know, in the day-to-day -day life, I've heard him described it. He's one of the kindest, most generous, 
uh, most well-informed individuals that people have ever uh, been around. Um, and I've watched his roundtable discussions that he did all during COVID. And so there's definitely, um, I mean, I've made a little bit of a study of Donald Trump over the past six years, and there's definitely different personas that he presents. And the, the persona that he presented to the world, his Twitter game was part of that. That was part of the sort of, um, you know, bull in the China shop. Oh my God, what is he going to say now? Yeah. And a lot of what he did was, uh, you know, rattling the keys over here, keeping the rabid media dogs watching in one direction while other things were taking place. Because the yeah. truth is he opened up the investigations on. Uh, and he was obviously very smart. I mean, yeah. he, he's obviously very, very smart. He wouldn't have got to where he is. I, I, I agree with Dom right there. His, yeah. his policies were good, but he needed to curb his bloviating. I, I just think that was that was an unprofitable waste of time for the yeah. president of the United States. I think it was but part of the strategy. Maybe it was part of his persona. Maybe it was part, yeah. of, part of what made him who he was. So yeah, and I think, history, I think history will be more kind to him than the present has been uh, from a from a just, you know, from an overall perspective. Um, I think, you know, we've, we've been talking for an hour and I, I truly appreciate your time here. It's just awesome to have this conversation. I know that it has sparked a lot of, uh, you know, some, some not so good feelings in some of our listeners. I think that it's got people thinking. Um, I think it's important that we don't all agree and have a circle jerk in our conversations about what's going on on the world stage. And I love having the point of view of somebody who's actually in the country, boots on the ground, or you were on the country, now you're in Romania. But um, this is important. And I want to say this to my listeners. It's really important that we hear other people's perspective, because if we don't, then we become cancel culture. And that is something that we absolutely want to avoid at all costs. Right. We don't have to agree on everything. We don't have to uh, buy everything that everybody's saying. That's 100% okay. We have that right as Americans. And and people like you, Chuck, have fought to preserve and protect that. So I want to. I mean, I realize that I've got a, I've, I've got a worldview or a, a, yeah. at least a, 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 an angle on things that a lot of people don't get because I spend the vast majority of my time outside the United States in very, very bad places around the globe, and that gives me a different perspective on things, and it, it also gives me a different perspective on U.S politics because i'm seeing it from the outside in most of the time mm -hmm. uh i mean I, you know and and uh i think when it comes you were you were starting to ask like what can we do uh, yeah. you're voting at the ballot box that doesn't do any good they cheat you know so so what's next so you, you know you vote with a rifle well i don't i don't know that it's time to do that yet but i think that a lot of people are starting to vote with their feet and they're starting to 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 go i'm going to to divest myself as much as possible from the beast and let the beast collapse under the weight of its own evil so that we don't have to pick up rifles. Um, and, and that might be the a more long-term way, but a less bloody way to, to do it. It might not work, but at least it's worth a try. And I know a lot of people that have decided to do that. Yeah. You know, I, I think, I think that both can be, I, I think that we can do that. I believe that we, we, we still need to vote. Um, because, oh, yeah, no, no yeah. doubt. Yeah, so I just want to make that clear. You're not saying don't vote. No, gosh, no. I'm just we, saying that we have a lot of people are like you and I kind of feel like, you know, well, we have I'm to do vote, more. but a lot of good it does, you know. Yeah. Well, Especially and, when the government steals 50% of my income and uses it to fund programs that I vote against. Right. And people are people are, are, are flooding the zone at the local level. And that is what we're seeing that they are replacing those. Uh, people who have failed them at the local level. And that is what I think is, is really um, going to spark the, the, the major changes that we need because these local politicians, the boards of supervisors, the school boards, uh, you know, politics is downstream from culture. Well, they've yeah. usurped the culture at the local level. Yeah. And that is why we have uh, the crazy things that we have happening, even with our kids. Now we don't have time to get into that conversation. Uh, you've actually written a book on, uh, it's, what, what's the title of your book? Making men. Is that, uh, no, I have 10 books in print, but that's, oh, uh, that's one about family, about young men. Uh, uh, that one. And then the follow-up to that one is called prowess. Uh, the man you were meant to be, 
Uh, okay. So making men five steps to growing up and prowess the man you're meant to be, or they go together. That's a conversation I would love to have another time because I think that it's essential uh, to bring that conversation to the forefront. That is at the um, that is on the heart of many of my listeners. Many of them are parents, grandparents. Uh, they're seeing what's happening to our children. And so, guys, uh, how can people find your work? How can they check out your book? I think it would be great if if people read your books, those books, uh, and then I had you back for a conversation about that. That would be awesome. Um, I, I mean, Google my name, you find out way more about me than you ever wanted to know. <laughs> um, but, uh, the, you know, of course my, my podcast is the, the hot zone podcast, uh, YouTube and, t um, all the other platforms. Um, and then you, you know, you follow me on Facebook and Twitter and Instagram and blah, 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 all that. Okay. I'm trying to be, I'm trying to work harder on just creating content. ChuckHolton.locals.com is probably the best place okay. for behind the scenes stuff. Uh, you know, what I'm doing day to day and the kind of uh, information that I'm consuming that's forming my views on things. I will put those up on ChuckHolton.locals.com so that you can kind of see those for yourself. Okay. I want to be, you know, full full disclosure with people. So if yeah. I'm reading an article about something, I want you to read it too and see what you think. Great, great. And and tell I, I again I want I want you to tell people how to find the books that you've written, uh, making yeah, them Yeah, they're all on Amazon and everywhere. Just find them on Amazon. Uh, hey. Chuck Holton, just just look me up. Yeah, I think it'd be interesting. Uh I do you have anything else you want to add today? This I actually wrote a novel about Ukraine. Okay. That had to do with labs in Ukraine. Wait, what? Uh, like yeah. Oh. How are yeah, we I, getting this? I actually wrote a novel in 2007 <laughs> about a secret weapons lab in Ukraine. What? I'm I'm not kidding you. And <laughs> I and I it's that was so long ago that I picked it up the other day. I was looking at it and I started reading and I was like, "Oh, this is great. I wonder what happens." <laughs> like I didn't even remember the story anymore. So Dear Obama went as a senator uh, to set up these labs. Oh my goodness. So it was that part of your source material. Can you divulge that? Well, I, I did a ton of research on, uh, Ukraine and came over here to, to do research on for the book before I wrote the book. And there, uh, and so I created a fictional lab that was, it's, you're going to have to read, it's a long story, but you have to read the story, but, um, wow. so the lab is not, there, it has no bearing on true events that I know of, but it was based on all that aggregated information that I learned studying Ukraine. And I thought Ukraine would be a great place to put a bioweapons lab. Or maybe, not bioweapons lab, just maybe, a weapons lab. Maybe you should reread that and we should revisit Maybe I'm a prophet. I got to go read my yeah. own book and find out what I said. I think maybe you had some prophetic leanings there. Um, <laughs> that's amazing. What was the name of your book, of that book? Meltdown. Meltdown. As it, is it still available on Amazon? Yeah, oh yeah, sure. Okay, guys, go check it out. I want to see what Chuck told us in 2007, and he doesn't remember. Was I don't even remember, but I mean, I remember the general gist of it. It's the third book in the yeah. series, which is about a colorless, odorless liquid explosive that was being used by terrorists, and it came from a lab in Ukraine. So there you go. Well, there you go. There Without you go. Without giving away the story, that's what I can tell you. There's a comment on YouTube I want to respond to. This is uh, Shizuka. Um, this person says, this is a great talk from both sides, which we cannot see so much. Thank you and God bless you. I appreciate that comment. I'm not on YouTube right now, so I can't check it out. You can follow me on YouTube, Mary Grace Media. I'll be there as long as they don't uh, ban my channel. But um, I, I think- get her or something. Uh, I'm actually on Truth Social and that- okay. That's where I'm going to be. I'm at Mary Grace and I'm at Mary Grace Media. And um, Chuck, we've got to get you on Truth Social. I can help you set that up if you want. We can get you a verified account over there. I, I don't, I mean, I think I have an account. I don't know if it's verified. I have yeah, I've been I, a little occupied. I can help, I can help you. Get it. I can help you get it verified. Um, so I just got mine verified, but that would be awesome. And um, everybody, please check out his work, chuckholton.locals.com. Check out his books on Amazon. And, uh, you know, let me know your thoughts, uh, get in touch with him, let him know your thoughts. He is on the move. He is reporting from the field. So don't get butthurt if he doesn't respond right away to your comments. Um, we're grownups here. 
And uh, we want to keep this dialogue going. So I would love to have you back on the show anytime you're welcome on the show. And uh, I really do truly appreciate your time. And thank you for serving our country in the military. We really do honor and appreciate you and your family's sacrifice on that front. And uh, stay strong, stay safe, and may God bless you. All right. God bless you. All right. Take care. Bye. Take care.